In our state, we have moved to an all-payer system. With the Affordable Care Act, we now Did have moved all our acute care hospitals that drive our costs uh, in the center away from fee for service and what? actually to pay, we pay them based on how well they keep patients, they keep patients out of the, the hospital, hospital, how well they, they keep their patients. patients. That's the future. We need to build on the Affordable Care Act, do the things that work, and reduce costs and increase access. All right, I think that's kind of powerful. What I just said is one of the models that we will be looking at to make sure we do get costs down. We do limit a lot of the unnecessary costs that we still have in the system. But with all due respect, to start over again with a whole new debate is something that I think would set us back. The Republicans just voted last week to repeal. Bernie is gritting his teeth. Thank goodness President Obama vetoed it and saved Obamacare for the American people. Let me ask you this, though. We've talked about Medicare for all, and tonight we've released a very detailed plan uh, just two, two hours before the debate we did. But let me ask you about Vermont, because in Vermont, uh, you tried in the state of Vermont, and Vermont walked away from this kind of idea of, it, of Medicare for all, single payer, because they concluded it would require major tax well, increases on some estimates that would double the budget. Andrew, let me just say, let me just say, you might want to ask the governor of the state of Vermont why he could not do it. I'm not the governor, I'm the senator from the state of Vermont. But second of all, second of all, here is what the real point is. In terms of all of the issues you've raised, the good questions you've raised, you know what it all comes down to? Do you know why we can't do what every other country, major country on earth is doing? It's because we have a campaign finance system that is corrupt. We have super PACs, we have the pharmaceutical industry pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into campaign contributions and lobbying, and the private insurance companies as well. What this is really about it's not the rational way to go forward. It's Medicare for all. It is whether we have the guts to stand up to the private insurance companies <laughs> at all. Yeah. A, a little bit of experience standing up to the health insurance industry that spent many, many millions of dollars attacking me and probably will so again because of what I believe we can do building in the Affordable Care Act. I think it's important to point out that there are a lot of reasons we have the health care system we have today. I know how much money influences the political decision making. That's why I'm for huge campaign finance reform. However, we start our system with even during the Affordable Care Act debate, there was an opportunity to vote for what was called the public option. In other words, people could buy into Medicare. And even when the Democrats were in charge of the Congress, we couldn't get the votes for that. So what I'm saying is this has been don't vote for me is what she's saying for decades we have the affordable care act let's make it work let's take the models that states are doing we now have driven costs down to the lowest they've been in 50 years now we've got to get individual costs down that's what i'm planning to do we're going to take a turn now secretary clinton in his final state of the union address President Obama said his biggest regret was his inability to bring the country together. If President Obama couldn't do it, how will you? Well, I think it's an important uh, point the President made in his State of the Union. Uh, and here's what I would say. I will go anywhere to meet with anyone at any time to find common ground. That's what I did as a First Lady when I worked with both Democrats and Republicans to get the Children's Health Insurance Program. When I worked with Tom DeLay, one of the most partisan of Republicans, to reform the adoption and foster care system. What I did working in the Senate, where I crossed the aisle often, working even with the senator from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, to get TRICARE for National Guardsmen and women. And it's what I did as Secretary of State on numerous occasions, and most particularly rounding up two-thirds votes in order to pass a treaty that lowered 
the nuclear weapons in both Russia and the United States. So I know it's hard, but I also know you've got to work at it every single day. I look out here, I see a lot of my friends from the Congress, and I know that they work at it every single day. Because maybe you can only find a little sliver of common ground to cooperate with somebody from the other party, but who knows, if you're successful there, maybe you can build even more. That's what I would do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. A couple of years ago, when we understood that veterans were not getting the quality care they needed in a timely manner, I worked with folks like John McCain and others to pass the most comprehensive veterans' health care legislation in modern history. But let me rephrase your question because I think, if, in all due respect, your expression, in all due respect, <laughs> you're missing the main point. And the main point in the Congress is not that Republicans and Democrats hate each other. That's a mythology from the media. The real issue is that Congress is owned by big money and refuses to do what the American people want them to do. The real issue is that in area after area, raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, the American people want it. Rebuilding our public infrastructure, creating less 13 million jobs. The American people want it. Pay equity for women. The American people want it. Demanding that the wealthy stop paying their fair share of taxes. The American that's, people want it. Let's talk. Let's look at what it is. We have got to make Congress respond to the needs of the people. It's not just what you're saying. Let me continue. <laughs> politics, even critical of the Democratic Party, even saying in a book you wrote, quote, there wasn't a hell of a big difference between the two major parties. How will you win a general, how will you win a general election labeling yourself a Democratic Socialist? Because what I believe and what I was just saying, the Democratic Party needs major reform. To those of you in South Carolina, you know what, in Mississippi, we need a 50-state strategy so that people in South Carolina and Mississippi can get the resources that they need. Instead of being dependent on super PACs, we need to be dependent on small individual campaign contributors. We need an agenda that speaks to the needs of working families and low-income people, not wealthy campaign contributors. We need to expand. We need to expand what the input into the Democratic Party. I am very proud that in this campaign, we have seen an enormous amount of excitement from young people, from working people. We have received more individual contributions than any candidate in the history of this country up to this point. campaign for Vincent Sheehy when he was running for governor. We can talk all we want about wanting to build a stronger Democratic Party, but let's do the question you answer. There's no laughing matter. The most recurring question I get on a stand up chair all across the aisle and talk with my neighbors is, how are you going to heal the divisions and the wounds in our country? This is the biggest challenge we face as a people. All my life I've brought people together over over deep divides and an outlet very back there. wounds. And that's what we need now in a new leader. We cannot keep talking past each other. We claim all Republicans are our enemies. Or the war is all about being against millionaires and billionaires, or it's all against American Muslims, or all against immigrants. Look, as Frederick Douglass said, we are one. Our country is one. And we must help each other if we're going to have to see And that is, you are right. All of us have denounced Trump's attempt to divide this country, the anti-Latino rhetoric, the racist rhetoric, the anti-Muslim rhetoric. But where I disagree with you, Governor O'Malley, is I do believe we have to deal with the fundamental issues of a handful of billionaires who control the economic and political life of this country. I do not think we will get out unless we have a political revolution where millions of people yeah. will finally stand up. We're going to get into that. Coming up a certain from YouTube. It's from a young video blogger who has over 5 million subscribers. He has a question about the importance of younger voters. Hi, I'm Connor Petta. I'm 23, and my audience is around the same age. Getting my generation's vote should be a priority for any presidential candidate. 
Now, I know Senator Sanders is pretty popular among my peers, but what I want to know is how are all of you planning on engaging us further in this election? Well, thanks for the question, and uh, congratulations on 5 million viewers on YouTube. That's quite an accomplishment. Look, this election is mostly about the future, and therefore it is of greatest urgency for young people. I've laid out my ideas about what we can do to make college affordable, how we can help people pay off their student debt and save thousands of dollars, how we can create more good jobs. Because a lot of the young people that I talk with are pretty disappointed about the economic prospects they feel they're facing. So making community college free, making it possible to attend a public college or university with debt-free tuition, Looking for ways to protect our rights, especially from the concerted Republican assault on voting rights, on women's rights, on gay rights, on civil rights, on workers' rights. And I know how much young people value their independence, their autonomy, and their rights. So I think this is an election where we have to pull young people and older people together to have a strategy about how we're going to encourage even more Americans to vote because it is absolutely clear to me that turning over our White House to the Republicans would be bad for everybody, especially young people. Paul, before you say fall, why is Senator Sanders beating you two to one among younger voters? I, I look, I have the greatest respect for Senator Sanders and uh, for his supporters and I'm going to keep working as hard as I can. Uh, to reach as many people of all ages uh, about what I will do, what the experience and the ideas that I have that I will bring to the White House, and I hope to have their support when I'm the Democratic nominee. <laughs> And it's a commercial break. I think we have a whole lot of young people here tonight. <laughs> hey, one quick thing. I just wanted Tom and Angie, I don't know if you're in this room, but Tom and Angie let us use this space. How awesome is that? Our prize. Yvette Wiley, come on down. Oh, yeah, here's what we got. You just want some yoga from We Love Yoga Studio. Free five, five class packs. So, five classes. Okay, and a couple other things I just wanted to remind people is January 23rd, they're having a live streaming of Bernie to the grassroots, which is us. And we're going to be meeting at the Transportation Workers Union Hall, which is down Pine on the east side. Feel free to look at the national events page. Join us for that event. It'll be really good. Also, if you're not registered to vote, we have voter registration forms. If you're wanting some merchandise from the Democratic County, uh, Tulsa Democratic County right there, buy some merchandise from the Proceeds go to the local Democrats. And so buy some burning gear. And also, hey, we haven't raised any money. This is all people power. And I just want to encourage you guys to go to the national website and donate some money so Bernie can win in Iowa and New Hampshire. And South Carolina and Nevada, hopefully. Alright, that's it. Thanks. Oh. Oh, Houston, 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 Houston,